come to Raffaut Town, which sits in the epicentre of a gigantic Neolithic complex in East Donegal. It comprises portal tombs, wedge tombs, standing stones, and of course the famous Beltany Stone Circle, which is no more than about a mile away to the south of us here. The reason I'm investigating this is because it seems that nobody else has taken notice of the fact that there's such a large quantity of monuments all nestled in the one area, a veritable Boyne Valley of the north of Ireland. St Eunan's Cathedral and the town of Raffo itself are some of the more recent examples of cultures placing their claim on this ancient sacred landscape. Our Neolithic predecessors quickly identified this area as a place of special significance and began building monuments linking them to the land almost as soon as they had arrived. Behind me is a statue by Maurice Harran as part of a public art project rolled out across towns and villages in Donegal. This statue represents one of our pre-Celtic ancestors believed to have worshipped up at the local Beltany Stone Circle. This inspiring enigmatic figure stands drawing down the sun a symbolic act of focusing solar energy for the purposes of the people. In this act, she becomes the bridge between the heavens and the hallowed earth. In the Gaelic language, Beltane means the fires of Baal, who was an ancient sun god believed to have pre-Celtic origins. Archaeological discoveries at the site show a definite link to worship during the early Bronze Age. This site, however, is older again. With 67 stones remaining from the original 80, it is one of the most complete and compelling stone circles in Northern Europe. Its prominent position on Topps Hill sits at the centre of a Neolithic complex of stone alignments, tombs and cairns. What we do know is that this type of monument, this gigantic circle of stones, which seems to be a natural uh, viewer for not only everything around you, but also the heavens above you, these things are not unique to Ireland. Today on the banks of Loch Foyle, a modern cargo vessel retraces the route first plied by Stone Age explorers seeking sheltered, fertile valleys. This loch leads far inland and would have represented a swift highway to a veritable promised land. Recent genetic evidence shows this region of Ireland was discovered by Neolithic farmers from the Iberian Peninsula roughly 9,000 years ago. During this time, the Irish Sea had formed, thereby preventing migration to Ireland overland. This challenge was met by a sophisticated, ocean-going society that geneticists believe originated in present-day Galicia, in northern Spain. After their arrival on shore, and the new settlers to Ireland would have sought out places like this, a naturally occurring cave not far from the shoreline, to spend their first few days here and get acclimatised to the surroundings. Beautiful scenery and heavily forested landscape brimming with life awaited our ancestors after their first nights on shore. Excavations tell us that food from the ocean still formed a large part of our ancestors' diet, long after these farmers settled well inland. 10,000 years after the ways of the hunter-gatherer were forsaken for food produced by local labour, these early architects were about to spark off an age of megalithic construction in the fertile Lagan Valley, which rivals similar sites in Stone Age Europe. The townland of Kilmonaster in East Donegal boasts the remains of 12 eminently constructed passage tombs, which form a small Neolithic necropolis. With no written record available, modern-day anthropologists can only hazard guesses as to the belief system of the great tomb builders. One thing is glaringly obvious. Their beliefs were strong enough to spur them on in the Herculean task of moving stones many tons in weight with only the most rudimentary technology. The tomb is typical of the kind that you would find in Kilmonaster. Relatively well built originally in a basic cruciform pattern. So I'm just going to walk up here now through where the original entrance would have been. Bear in mind that it would have been down on my hands and knees crawling into this tomb. So these would have supported the capstone and we'd be crawling in through a very narrow chamber, almost womb-like, entering in here. You'd notice the change in air pressure, you'd notice the change in air temperature. The ground would be dry, but you'd have that scent of moisture in it. You'd be coming in here. Now, this is where the sensory deprivation begins to occur. So once you get into the chamber here, 
these side chambers affect the way your ears pick up sound so you're going to start hearing the outside world disappear as you slowly but surely enter the world of the ancestors and uh, hear the sound of your own heartbeat, the sound of your own breathing and nothing else. This was a totally insulated chamber keeping all sound outside. Very very similar to the tombs at Newgrange. At the back here this is the end chamber which is slightly larger in this tomb than the two antechambers out to either side and the entire structure is roughly about 20 foot long. Some of the largest stones here at Kilmonaster in this particular tomb, which is one of the best preserved ones, even though it is a bit uh, broken down, some of the largest capstones are in or around three or four tons. So you're looking at a very extensive building project and a very long term one. The original mound at, above this site would have been made of earth, clay, any spare rocks, with a kerb all the way around the outside of it to keep that mound intact. And it would have been roughly about this high, so about 10 feet, 12 feet high off the ground. We're sitting in the end chamber at the back of the tomb in Kilmonaster and originally the ground level would have been several feet lower and my head would have been just touching the top of a capstone that would have weighed up to three tons. Now, I'm trying to put myself in the mindset of these people here for a, a spiritual experience and I can honestly say that even now with my back to this cold stone there's a certain claustrophobia to it, a very a narrow and closed almost womb like space. Um, even some of the large stones around me now are blocking some of the sound from the outside although I'm still aware that I'm in the open air but I think if I was in a tomb that was still functioning to its original capacity right now I would be in a very different headspace, a headspace that's far more contemplative and and self uh, self aware than the one I would be in if I was walking around outside. Recently, I gave a lecture to the Raimahi Parishes Historical Society, during which I outlined the incredible heritage left to us by our intrepid ancestors. Sadly, the monuments remaining represent only a fraction of the original number. Many individual standing stones, cairns and even tombs have been destroyed by field clearance and other activity in recent years. In years to come is going to show that this area, for some reason, whether it was luck or whether it was, like I said earlier on, planned as a sacred landscape, had a serious effect on how people on the British Isles started making their monuments in the thousands of years to come after the first people arrived here. In this land which I hold sacred, I am privileged to behold the legacy of my ancestors, still standing between earth and sky.